This week, we're taking a look at a handful of some of the most iconic roles in popular culture, and how things could have been a little bit different if a few actors who were offered the roles had taken them. How would this have shaped movies? How would this have shaped the careers of the actors involved? And how would this have affected the entire direction of popular culture as we know it? And when I say iconic roles, I'm talking about some big ones. I'm talking about Han Solo, Indiana Jones, Neo from The Matrix, just some big, big, huge roles. Things that when you think of movies, these are the characters that come to mind. So let's get right into it. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna take a look at the stories behind these alternate castings and sort of why they didn't happen, why the actors didn't wind up taking these roles that they were offered or that they were talked about. But before we do that, allow me to introduce myself. I'm John Algetz, and joining me this week is a good friend of mine, it's Owen Poole. How's it going, everybody? Yeah. Owen and I here, we're going to be talking about this. You're going to be joining us on this adventure for the next, you know, 45 to 60 minutes or so. Yes. In the uh, prep for this, I was shocked at some of these names on this list here. There were some crazy alternate castings. And like, let's let's just dive right into what I think is probably the craziest one. The one that would have had the largest effect on things. And that is... Al Pacino was offered a part in Star Wars, and not just any part. He was offered the part of the dashing scoundrel Han Solo himself. Also known as everyone's favorite Star Wars character. I mean, either that or C-3PO, I would argue. Really? C-3PO? I really like C-3PO. I've, I've heard more people say R2-D2 is their favorite character, but most people, when you ask them who's your favorite Star Wars character... It's usually Han Solo. Everyone loves Han. There's no reason not to. He's usually pretty high up on the list, at least. But uh, yeah, Al Pacino could have been Han Solo. And basically, the story behind this was, at the time, Al Pacino was kind of at one of the high points of his career. You know, he had done Godfather. He had done Godfather Part Two. He was one of these people in Hollywood who people were just throwing roles at him left and right which is actually why we wound up not getting him as Han Solo. Because when the script for Star Wars came across his desk, he was in a mindset where he was thinking to himself, you know, I can take any role that I want. And so he was being super picky about it. And when he read Star Wars, apparently he didn't get it. Like, he I mean, I could, I could see that. There's a We obviously are so familiar with Star Wars now as it sits that obviously, oh yeah, of course it makes sense. It's, a, it's, it's Star Wars. Everyone knows Star Wars. But at the time... There's a lot of concepts being thrown around, like the Force, and you basically have space monks and all these things. And it's not really a science fiction movie in the traditional sense. So I could see people reading the script. I mean, didn't Alec Guinness have a similar experience, even though he took the part of yeah, Obi-Wan? Yeah, he, he sort of, if I remember correctly from what I've read about it, he didn't necessarily not understand it, but he just didn't really care for it. Because Alec Guinness who played Obi-Wan, in case you don't know. Um, Sir Alec Guinness was kind of just like, oh, this is a movie that's going to pay my bills. Like, this is going to pay my mortgage. This isn't, like, a serious thing that I'm going to, like, take on. And then it wound up being the role that he's, like, most remembered for. Which I'm sure he just loved that. Speaking of an actor who didn't take a role that he was offered because he didn't understand it, uh, Sean Connery was offered the role of Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. But he didn't take it because he read the script for those movies. And he was just like, I don't understand anything that's happening in this. I'm not going to do this. This well, is weird. <laughs> unless you're, unless you're Christopher Lee, who's like the, the mo who was sadly the most massive Lord of the Rings fan. Even to the point that he was like correcting the script on set. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I could see, you know, as you said, that was, a, there's not that many low points in Al Pacino's career. He's no. kind of been pretty prolific even today. That movie has a lot of unknowns. Like George Lucas was not a well-known director. Harrison Ford wasn't well-known at all. I didn't, had Mark Hamill ever been in anything before? Had Carrie Fisher been in anything before? They had, uh, they had all been in, in smaller roles before. Uh, Carrie Fisher, obviously being the daughter of Debbie Reynolds, really uh, went a long way towards boosting her you know, marketability as yeah. an actor. Harrison Ford had actually been in uh, a previous George Lucas Film. He's he like only in, other movie. He had been in American Graffiti and then a few smaller things here or there before that. But the story of how Harrison Ford was actually cast in the role, you know, a lot of people have heard that, you know, he was a carpenter. He was like working on a shelf in the casting office uh, at the time. And they just asked him to read with somebody. 
as as Han Solo. He wound up going in there reading it, and the casting director and George Lucas was just like, "Oh yeah, this this is the guy." Checks out again. There's no mistake. You can't find Organa Major. I found it. It just isn't there. Well, and the, there's just something about his look that sells it so perfectly. I mean, again, it's one of those things we've lived with this movie since 1977. We can't really imagine other people playing that such an iconic role. But there's just something about how he looks and how he carries himself. And that's true in other roles of his. Harrison Ford has kind of... He, he got the part of Han Solo and he's kind of proceeded to be Han Solo for the rest of his life. Yeah. I feel. Um, even, even in, you know, even in some of his other iconic roles, such as Indiana Jones or the president from Air Force One, um, <laughs> he's, he's still very much has that air of Han Solo to him. He still very much feels like a dashing smuggler as opposed to president of the United States. But uh, imagine imagine a world, and we will get to this later, where we will be actively imagining this world. But try to imagine a world where, where Al Pacino had instead been in that role. Kind of crazy. But speaking of Harrison Ford, another, another great one, another iconic character that he's played, probably a character who some people might argue is more iconic, depending on how they feel about Star Wars, would be Indiana Jones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's an air of like nerdiness about Star Wars that it took a little long longer to adopt in you know mainstream pop culture than Indiana Jones did. Indiana Jones I think had had probably more mainstream appeal at the time. Yeah, cuz it was just a it was just a straight up action adventure film. Yeah. Um but some people have in fact I would say most people have probably heard the story that that role was originally supposed to go to one Tom Selleck. Um Tom Selleck being of course the the actor behind the magnificent Magnum PI. Uh, if you don't just detect the oozing sarcasm coming off of my throat. My dad loved Magnum P.I. Magnum is good in small doses. To me, my favorite episode of Magnum P.I. would be the one that crossed over with Murder, She Wrote. (laughs) Because Murder, She Wrote is awesome. Murder, She Wrote is amazing. And if anybody tries to tell me otherwise, you're just wrong. But uh, yeah, Tom Selleck was almost Indiana Jones. He... He actually even got so far that there is, there are at the very least stills, but there might even just straight up be footage of camera tests with him and the actress who played uh, Marion. And he's in the full getup. He's got the jacket. He's got the whip. He's got the hat. He He's like, he is Indiana Jones. But ultimately he had to cut out from that role because he, Magnum was you know, starting to get going. And so deal. he had to go f- shoot that and like scheduling wise, it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to work out, but we almost got Quigley. Quigley. As Indiana Jones. Uh, for those of you who've never seen the movie Quigley Down Under, uh, you absolutely should. It is a gem. It is one of my favorite Westerns of all time. Maybe it's one of those things where I just grew up with it. So I think that it's magnificent. That, but... That's probably part of it. And I don't know, I'm, I'm a kind of a sucker for Tom Selleck. I actually think he kind of would have killed it as Indiana Jones. Yeah, he probably would have. Let's move on. To, let's move on to another role. Uh, and this is one that actually you brought up to me. And uh, that was the fact that Will Smith could have been Neo in The Matrix. Yeah, that, that's a big one. Whoa. Especially for us, considering we were... Pretty young when the original Matrix came out, and that is what such... was that, 98, 99? I think it came out in 99. Yeah, so we were about nine years old. And that movie has such an outsized influence on action films going forward. Like, that bullet time thing, everyone wanted to do stuff like that. Everyone it, wanted to get smarter with their with their action movies. And it didn't just, uh, it didn't just affect like movies it affected all pop culture because after that you got things like the max Payne series that was using bullet time as like a major gameplay mechanic it had a massive impact now imagine that film without keanu reeves but uh the actual story behind what wound up happening with that is actually kind of funny i think um so at the time will smith had just gotten done doing men in black you know big big film in his career i would say probably in terms of successful films probably top five will smith movie and he was he was sitting there one day and he had a meeting with the wachowskis now the wachowskis come in and they're pitching him on the matrix and apparently we're not talking like ryan george level pitch meeting no we're talking like (laughs) a really bad pitch meeting all right at least this is the way that will smith tells it he says that the pitch was so bad that he just was completely turned off to the role he was just like i just 
I'm just done. On top of the fact that he didn't fully understand it, he was just kind of just like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go do this Wild Wild West thing instead. Yeah, that had career killing potential right there. I think, I think anyone other than Will Smith might not have been able to survive Wild Wild West. That being said, have you seen Kevin Klein in anything in a while? Anything since Wild Wild West? He, truthfully, he has done stuff. But, well, I'm sure he has. But <laughs> he might have taken a hit. Not as high profile. West. No. Um, but in in hindsight, Will Smith in interviews and stuff has actually said that uh, he he's actually kind of thankful that he didn't take it because he really enjoys those films and they're such an iconic piece of cinema. And he's he has said that he specifically enjoys the chemistry between Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne. Which, it's true. In the first film, you can definitely see that there. Well, and then we get Jada Pinkett Smith in the, then we in get the sequels. Jada, we do get his wife in the in the sequels. Which is pretty great. Which is pretty great. And honestly, like, the best part about Jada Pinkett Smith appearing in those uh, m- movies, to me, probably has to be Enter the Matrix, the game. That was a good game. Uh, mm, good. <laughs> Maybe not the best word to use for when that. When I was, like... 12 13 when it came yeah, out when i was when i was a, a a middle schooler and it came out i thought it was awesome but now i look back and i'm like that's just budget max paint with like a matrix coat of paint on it but it was cool because it had like film it had fmv sequences that starred matrix and a good example it. of a very early form of transmedia oh yeah you don't uh, need, we don't the, need to talk about that no! Here's one that I definitely want to deep dive into. Earlier, we we talked about uh, Sean Connery as Gandalf, a possibility there in Lord of the Rings. But did you know that there was another character in Lord of the Rings who could have not just been played by one other alternate actor, but actually had a whole slew of other actors who were offered the role that didn't take it before it eventually went to the actor that it went to. I'm, of course, talking about the King of Gondor himself. Aragorn. The king who returned. The king who returned. Aragorn could have actually been played by, and this is this is not a joke, Russell Crowe, Stuart Townsend, Daniel Day-Lewis, Nicolas Cage, and reportedly Vin Diesel auditioned, but didn't get a call back. Now, the one that I want to touch upon here is Nick Cage. Yeah, like aside from Vin Diesel, all those names you mentioned, like I could kind of see... Dude, I want to I want to I want to see a world where Daniel Day-Lewis was Aragorn. Can you imagine the method acting for for being Aragorn? Like how do you method act being an orc slaying butt kicker? I mean, Viggo Mortensen already broke his toe making that movie. Oh yeah. So like, you just imagine the lengths that Daniel Day-Lewis would go to. Well, there's a there's an anecdote he says in the in the uh, special features for the two towers where Viggo Mortensen says he killed like every extra dozens of times in oh, filming yeah. Helm's Deep sequence because he's just running around like a mad lad. Just well, and does that that just goes into how long it took them to film that? Oh yeah, I think it was like forty days of night shoots. Yeah. Well, I mean the the three films all together were three years of production where and I, that means like three years where the actors were away from the united states and that was the main reason nicholas cage turned it down yes yeah because uh so at the time nick cage um at least what he has said in interviews about this role is that he had to turn it down because sort of life at the time had gotten in the way you know he he had a family and everything was going on with him so he couldn't really justify going to a foreign country in this case new zealand for such a long period of time. So it's kind of understandable that uh, Nick Cage wouldn't want to do that. And again, just like in Will, just like in Will Smith's case, he has said in hindsight that he's kind of glad that he didn't take it because Nick Cage, Nick Cage is the kind of person who he has, and he has said on numerous occasions, he doesn't watch his own movies. He just can't. And I think, I think it's Adam Driver. Is yeah, the Adam same Driver's way. the same way. Adam yeah. Driver won't watch his own performances. That's why I think it was an interview with NPR. It was an NPR interview where he had to. Uh, a few months back. Where he had to leave. Yeah, he left because they started playing. A clip, from, of, a clip from Marriage Story. Yeah, one of his performances and he just bailed. Nick Cage is kind of the same way. And he's like, I love those movies. So I couldn't imagine not being able to watch them because I'm in them. Which, I mean, I kind of under, I understand. I feel like he, uh, again, we'll get into this more later. I feel like Nicolas Cage wouldn't be as much of a of a punchline or maybe he'd be more of a punchline and maybe those movies in general would be a punchline but uh let's 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 do something here that we haven't done yet and let's touch upon a mo- a tv role tv role you know cuz right now we're talking about we're talking about a major fantasy epic so let's transition from a major fantasy epic 
into another major fantasy epic. Now, say what you will about the final season of Game of Thrones. I'll say a lot of things about the final season or, of Game of Thrones. Or say what you will about the seventh or the sixth. The sixth one was or, good. Or part of the fifth. Uh, my point is, is that Game of Thrones had such a like stranglehold on our culture for a long time there. And I think that a large part of that has to do with Amelia Clark as Daenerys Targaryen. Yes. The mother of dragons. But did you know, Owen, that she was almost not Daenerys Targaryen? I did not know this until a couple hours ago. When I brought it up? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the role actually originally went to a young British actress by the name of Tamsin Merchant. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's a little bit of, a, of an odd name. Hope I'm getting it correctly. Uh, she actually had the role so much that it was announced that she was going to be playing the part. And she even went so far as to film the pilot. For some reason, and we don't actually have a confirmed story for why this didn't wind up working out when HBO wanted them to go back and reshoot the first episode. I guess the pilot was bad because the pilot was apparently really, really bad. It's all I, I've heard from many sources. I'm not like sources, but like I read a lot of places that the pilot for the original pilot for Game of Thrones was bad. Yeah, it was just not good. They believed in it enough that they wanted them to go back and, and reshoot it. But when that happened, Merchant was gone and Clark was put into the role. Um, there have been rumors and speculation that maybe she was pregnant. Um, there was other rumor and speculation that the showrunners just didn't like her. George R. R. Martin has gone on record to say that he thought that she did a great job and that she was going to make a great, uh, Daenerys. How would her career have panned out if she had gotten to be Daenerys? She might've gotten a Terminator movie. She might've gotten a Terminator movie. <laughs> I don't think anybody wanted that Terminator movie, like to be real. Oh no. Which one was that? Was that? Terminator Genesis. Genesis, yeah. Genesis. Woof. Fire cannot kill a dragon. There's another TV role that I actually brought up to you earlier today. I've actually been re-watching this show during all this, you know, stuck at home thing. And this is a show that I actually need to sit down and watch. Like, this is one of my biggest, one of my biggest, like, nerd confessions is that I haven't actually watched this show. It's okay. I mean, it's not really a nerdy show. Like, there's not a lot, there's not a ton of overlap between... Something well, like... Okay. Let me rephrase that. As somebody who works in the line of work that I do, it's a little unexpected that I haven't watched it. It's not for everyone. I'll admit some of it can be kind of boring. We're talking about Mad Men. Yeah, Mad Men. The iconic role of Don Draper, which we all know and love to be played by one John Hamm. I'm a big John Hamm guy. Gets to give me some ham and bubbly. <laughs> but according to John Hamm on the Mark Maron podcast when he was on it, the role was originally offered to one Thomas Jane. Doesn't have to be good, just has to look good. I just want my kids back. Tom Jane, I just want my kids back. I th I love Tom Jane, Tom Jane's awesome. Oh yeah, I, I still stand by that the, the Tom Jane Punisher movie is good. Like, to me, Tom Jane is Punisher. Not the other guy. No, not the other guy. And uh, I mean, John Barenthal kind of owns it. John Barenthal does a good job. But who's the other guy? Uh, the guy who was in Punisher Warzone or yeah. whatever. I don't remember his name. I don't either. <laughs> um, uh, I remember his face. And he might he might match the comic book a little bit more. But I remember going – we went and saw uh, Tom Jane's Punisher in, in theaters. theaters yeah. And I remember just walking out just being like, that was amazing. <laughs> it In hindsight, it's probably not as great. It has its moments. But I, I do like him as the character. And Tom Jane, very good in The Expanse, which I've been bugging you to watch. Yeah, I, I, you're not the only person. Um, Quite a few people have But supposedly the reason that Tom Jane didn't take the part is because at the time, which Mad Men premiered in 2007, I believe, so this must have been like roughly 2006. So this is before like big prestige TV was really a thing. I mean, like The Wire and The Sopranos were a thing. I mean, you could argue that, that Mad Men, like while Sopranos was probably the show that's credited with starting the golden age of television. Mad Men was probably the series that pushed it. Like, well, a a AMC had a big role in that with Mad Men and Breaking Bad. Oh, yeah. But anyway, that still, that was before like the big TV boom. And Tom Jane said, supposedly, that he didn't do television. And that was the reason he turned down the part. Which is funny because now he. He was the star of HBO's Hung. Yeah, he was part years of Hung. Years later. Uh, and, in The Expanse. And as you point out, in the expanse now it seems like tom tom jane's like whole career has moved to television so yeah those are those are some of the the major roles do you want to do a couple quick hits before we move on sure okay. one thing i recently watched the 
uh, Galaxy Quest documentary, Ooh. which was a great watch. Highly recommend it if you're a fan of Galaxy Quest. And if you're not a fan of Galaxy Quest, I'm, I'm concerned for you. <laughs> that... First off, Harold Ramis was supposed to be the director of Galaxy Quest. Which we could do an entire episode about directors who should have directed movies or movies that should have been directed by somebody else or could have been. Yeah, that, that's a whole other topic. And he specifically wanted Kevin Klein, who he mentioned earlier, to be the role, to be the, to be a Jason Nesmith as the yeah, captain. Yeah, the Tim Allen's role. Yeah. Uh, another one that is uh, that is worth mentioning that's maybe that maybe wouldn't have the biggest impact if it had changed would be uh, Claire Danes was almost Rose in, uh, in Titanic. Would have been kind of interesting to see that because did, wasn't Claire Danes? Uh, it would have been again. Would have she been acting with Leo DiCaprio? Yeah, because she was she was Juliet in Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if their careers would have wound up be, being parallel because of that. Yeah. Well, would they would they have been just like typecast as a couple from there on out? I mean. Even even Kate Winslet and Leo were in a movie together called Revolutionary Road, where they played a couple that I think had it was like one of those Oscar bait movies. I didn't end up seeing it. Yeah, I don't think that it was it was not anywhere near the level of success of you know a James Cameron's Titanic or a Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. That was who did Romeo and Juliet, right? Yeah, was Baz Luhrmann. He's got um, he's got that very specific style. Yeah, we'll just we'll 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 say that. Now, okay, here is where stuff gets really interesting. Let's try to think about these these alternate castings that we've been talking about here for a little bit. And how would these have affected the actors' careers? And let's start things off like we did with the last section, which with probably the one that, in my opinion, would have had the biggest effect just on pretty much everything. And that is Al Pacino as Han Solo. Yeah, hard to top that one. Yeah, that's that's that would be nuts. Um, so looking at the two actors' IMDb's, it kind of just leads you to question one major serious thing: Would Harrison Ford have a career? I mean, I feel like he at that at the time he had been in a couple things, and he was on the cusp of like breaking through, like, and with how talented he is, and how like his face is just for film. <laughs> Like, that is such a fantastic way of saying that a man is handsome. He's a handsome dude. So I feel like he would have gotten it, gotten through eventually, as long as he just kept going. Yeah, but do you think that he would be anywhere near the level that he wound up being? No, no. Because Star Wars, no one knew Star Wars was going to explode the way it did. And... You know, you can ride your Star Wars royalties forever if you want to. Pretty much. And it's a film that pretty much everyone has seen, so everyone knows who you are. And even if you haven't seen it, you know who Han Solo is. Yeah. Like if someone says Han Solo, it's going to it's gonna generate a, a certain character in your mind, and it's going to be Harrison Ford. But, you know, what if that wasn't the case? What does that do for him? I guess he would – I'm guessing he would still have a mildly successful acting career – but he wouldn't be as much of a household name as he currently is. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you on that one. I definitely do think that he would have had a career, but he would have been very much probably, unless he unless he had like another hypothetical film that we don't know about and that we will never know about, obviously, because we don't live in that reality. Unless he had another another role that sort of catapults him into fame, we probably would have just wound up with, you know, B-level Harrison Ford. You know, who's one of those guys who's you're like, oh, I know who that is. I can't tell you his name. Uh, like character actor Margot Martindale. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm going to shake my head like I know who you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> it's a running joke on a uh, BoJack Horseman. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that that begs a question. Would that then affect Indiana Jones? I think it probably would have considering that, you know, Lucas was behind Star Wars and, and had a Lucas hand in, and Spielberg were behind Indiana yeah. Jones. It's like, hey, we have – when Tom Selleck falls through, they have a guy like, oh, we have this kind of guy. But it kind of m- makes you wonder like if they didn't have such a fantastic choice waiting in the wing after Tom Selleck dropped through, would they have maybe like – delayed production on Raiders of the Lost Ark so that Tom Selleck could do Magnum. And then when that season is over, he could go do Raiders. That's probably what it ended up happening because are you really going to go this far 
with a certain actor so far as to get like test shots and all these things and then have to start from scratch? Because with Harrison Ford, you're not starting from scratch. Yeah, because again, like Lucas had worked with him and Spielberg, you know, trusts Lucas to be able to say like, hey, this is this is this is the guy. But if that guy isn't there, do they just hold off and wait for Selleck? You know, I would, and well, then, I would have waited for Selleck. Personally. And then what does that do to Selleck's career? Do we get Quigley Down Under in 1990? Probably not, just because of you know production times. Ass- assuming assuming a Tom Selleck helmed Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark is successful enough to warrant two sequels. Yeah, because Last Last Crusade was 89. 89, and then Quigley was 90. Was 90. <laughs> um, and that's. We probably get a much more famous Tom Selleck. I mean, everyone knows who he is, but I was I was gonna say you want to you want to back up on the more famous Tom Selleck because that mean, man is a national treasure. But yeah, you're you're kind of right. Like we would have had a more like probably a tier. You know, still rocking the stash. Never lose the stash. Never loses the mustache. It is his branding. Imagine imagine that an Indiana Jones with a mustache. I Instead can, of the scruffy beard, I can see it honestly. I, I like. I kind of. I kind of want to discover multi-dimensional travel, so I can go to that alternate universe where Tom Selleck was in Indiana Jones, just to watch it because I think that could be spectacular or spectacularly bad, one or the other. But yeah, I mean, looking looking at at Tom Selleck's career, like again, this isn't to, this isn't to diss on Tom Selleck. He would have been just a much bigger deal than he is. Does he get the opportunity to be the president in Air Force One? (laughs) Does he get the opportunity to tell that guy, get off my plane? I mean, Tom Selleck as the president with a sweet mustache. We need president mustache. That's what we need. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. Every time I picture Tom Selleck in a new role, I'm just, just, I just see mustache. That's all that you need to see with Tom Selleck is just mustache. But uh, let's, let's let's circle back because we started this talking about Al Pacino yes. casting. So maybe we should actually talk about Al Pacino here. Um, I honestly don't think it would have affected his career that much. See, I think that it would it would affect a few key things. Obviously, before that, he had already done Godfather. He had done Godfather and Godfather Part Two. So that part of his career is on lock. That's not being touched. But there is one major thing that would be stopped because of production timing, and that is him appearing in Scarface. You know, like if he is Han Solo, then that means he's in Return of the Jedi in 1983. Unless he gets him to kill Han Solo, like Harrison Ford wanted so badly. But even then, Han Solo wanted, or Harrison Ford wanted Han Solo killed in Return of the Jedi. So he's still in Return of the Jedi. Maybe he could have changed it. But does that mean that he doesn't get to do Scarface that came out the same year? But is he, is he going to be able to shoot in the Redwood Forest in Northern California... And then, like, you know, shoot there like three days out of the week. And then the next four days, he's in Miami shooting Scarface. Probably not. Like, it doesn't make a lot of logistical sense. So that means that we we don't see Al Pacino and Scarface. Maybe we don't see Scarface at all, you know? Or if we do see Scarface, maybe it's got like... Maybe it's Harrison Ford. (laughs) (laughs) Say hello to my little friend. I'm into it. (laughs) That was my best Harrison Ford impression that I think I've ever done. <laughs> you should still probably apologize. I should definitely apologize. That was still pretty bad. But uh, no, do we see like maybe like, uh, uh, you know, maybe they actually get an actual Cuban American to play the part. But if we're thinking like other other uh, sort of gangster actors who could play that role, maybe Ray Liotta. Yeah, he'd uh, probably do pretty well. I want to see Joe Pesci play that role (laughs) just Just give us more joe pesci just give just give me all of the joe pesci so yeah like that's that's gonna have a massive effect potentially on the careers of you know at the very least you're talking you know two people obviously harrison ford now pacino potentially three with tom Selleck, but that could also affect the careers of so many other people because if al pacino is suddenly doing star wars maybe he stops appearing in gangster films or crime Netflix. Maybe he doesn't do Heat, you know, maybe he doesn't, doesn't do, do the Irishman. Maybe he doesn't do the Irishman, in which case, like, either some other actor has slotted into those roles or, you know, we just wind up not getting those movies at all. Yeah, there's just huge ripple effects. As far as, like, Al Pacino's career trajectory, I feel like it's not going to 
change it that much because he's a household name. He's 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 a list. He's huge, and he's been a list since the seventies. So, like since he did Godfather, he's he's been a big deal. Unless he was in Star Wars and it and it tanked. Yeah, I don't I, I don't think that there's there is a a version of this story where Al Pacino isn't a huge star. Yeah, but don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again. So now let's 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 jump over to uh, the other casting that I think would probably have had the biggest impact. And that is, we discussed it, Will Smith as Neo. That Yeah, that's probably the most interesting one, especially with how we see Keanu Reeves in 2020. Yeah, and just his career in 2020. You know, like, because here's the thing about Keanu. He had done a lot of stuff before The Matrix, a lot of notable stuff before The Matrix. He had done, you know, Point Break was before, Speed was before. Um Dracula. Dr- Dracula, if you want to talk about that. Bill and Ted, <laughs> the Bill and Ted films were before that. You know, he had been in a lot of stuff, but around the time of the Matrix, his career was kind of dipping. Like he was he was on a bit of a downward decline. Um, well, aside from aside from speed and point break, a lot of his films weren't like action oriented. No. And he played kind of like a kind of like a dumb teenager in a lot of his films. And which Bill and Ted kind of just led to him getting cast like that. And then the Matrix is Completely the opposite. Yeah, the Matrix, suddenly you get this very cerebral, you know, very smart action film, you know. But yeah, he had, he had and he had been in something kind of similar to the Matrix a few years before. Back in 1995, he was in Johnny Mnemonic, which wasn't, it wasn't well received. I think it's, th- it's sitting at about 13% on Rotten Tomatoes currently. Ouch. You kind of got to wonder, like, if he, if, if Will Smith wound up doing the Matrix, this is another this is another situation where like a big A-list actor would have taken a role from somebody who wasn't A-list. And honestly, I don't think it would have had a major impact on Will Smith's career, but not doing the Matrix would have a huge impact on Keanu Reeves' career. Do you want to talk about Keanu or Will Smith first? Let's talk let's talk about um let's talk about Will because it's probably the easiest one to figure. Yeah, cuz at the at the time he had been in like he had been in Men in Black. Men in Black is like a Fresh comedy Prince action movie. was a thing that happened. And he'd never been in anything quite like The Matrix. He does eventually get into more dramatic, more serious roles like with Pursuit of Happiness and uh, I Am Legend and like Seven Pounds, stuff like that. Yeah. So he gets into that sort of stuff later in his career. But if he started with The Matrix in 1999, that immediately turns him from this like funny comic actor to Neo from the Matrix would have just been a big would like, have been tonal a shift big in shift. things that Huge. he's done so far. Yeah. Do you think that he would have just kind of had the same sort of career trajectory except he didn't do Wild Wild West? That's a good question. It just depends on how people viewed him post Matrix. Yeah. I will say we we at the very least know that we would miss out on a fantastic Will Smith rap track, which was the Wild Wild West song that he did. Oh yeah. <laughs> which is the best part of that movie. Like, by far. <laughs> yeah, because there's not a lot of good parts of that movie. But yeah, it, it just depends on how he's viewed post-Matrix if he would change the type of roles he gets cast for. Yeah, does, does he wind up doing, you know, any more comedy action films? Does he do Bad Boys? Or does he, from there, transition into, I'm going to start doing just, like, serious stuff? Yeah, who? It's it's hard to say. I think based on his just natural charisma... He wouldn't have stopped doing those kind of movies. Like he, like you got to get bad boys in there. I actually like. I think it, it's a little bit frowned upon to to like the bad boys films. I think because like there's there's this sort of uh, belief on the internet that Michael Bay is bad and that everything that he does is bad. But I actually really like the bad boys films. Like unironically like them. Yeah, but I mean, um, in two thousand one, he does Ali, which is a big meaty. Like character biopic piece. Yeah. Like, character role. And then he went on to do Men in Black 2 the next year. So it, he got he got to really pick and choose what he wanted to do. But here's the, but here's the thing to, to ask. Does he do Ali after being cast in such a big action-packed role? Because Ali is not an action-packed role. Like, does from there, does he wind up getting typecast as an action star? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly possible. And considering their film and major sequels after... But then he did, you know, I Robot after that, which is kind of a similar ish role to The Matrix in that it's it's a lot of sci it's very sci fi heavy, very action heavy. Yeah, that's that's another movie that I unapologetically like. 
I think iRobot's good. I I really I really enjoy that movie. Do people think it's bad? Do people hate it? Mm, it it doesn't have a great reputation. I don't think it's one of those movies that like people openly hate. But I you don't hear a lot of people talking like real great about it either. Um, I think that Alan Tudyk is probably the best part of that movie. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah, he Alan Tudyk's just great in everything that he does. <laughs> best part of Rogue One too. I know kung fu. But now, like, you gotta kind of ask yourself, what about Keanu? What about Keanu? You know? Would he be the internet god he is today? And that's something that we'll touch upon here in a little bit. But, you know, you just got to ask yourself, like, does he have does he have the success that he does after that? Do we get John Wick? I don't know if we get... I guess that's the big question. I don't know if we get John Wick. I think he... In Keanu's favor, say he doesn't do The Matrix, he has one ready-made role... I, I would love. I, I should research this. Who else they could have gotten to play this role? John Constantine. John Constantine. That is a that is a role that Keanu just recently in an interview said he would love to go back and play Constantine again because that is like the most Keanu role. Yeah. At that time. At the, especially at the time, it fit him so perfectly because he didn't really necessarily have to act that much. Um, he, he brooded real good in but, that movie. I will actually. I just remembered something. I will go out on a limb and say we definitely would not get John Wick. So John Wick, directed by Ch- by Chad Stahelski, he met Chad Stahelski because he was Keanu's stunt double on The Matrix. That's right. So we don't get John Wick because th- that relationship isn't there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. That wouldn't happen. It's crazy stuff. We would not have John Wick, which would be tragic. I don't think action in 2020 would be the same. Like we would not have gotten extraction without John Wick. Because that movie is basically the Russos do John Wick. We might still be in the the Paul Greengrass born shaky cam era of action films. Man, I'm really glad we're not in that anymore. I know. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I think the Bourne movies are pretty good, but the actual combat action is hard yeah. to follow. the The driving action is great. There's a lot of great driving. Sequences oh yeah, no, in that Bourne is movies. fantastic. Now let's 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 end off the section by once again let's do like some some rapid fire stuff and let's talk about some of the other people that we had mentioned. Let's start off with uh, Amelia Clark, Daenerys Targaryen. That's if, a good one. If if she didn't get that role, would we even know who the heck she is? Probably not. What did she take, do before Game take of Thrones? Take any actor from Game of Thrones and aside from Sean Bean, like think of Richard Madden, who was uh, Rob Stark. Yeah. Kit Harington as Jon Snow. He had he had in his defense he did. Uh, that Silent Hill sequel before <laughs> that Silent Hill sequel uh, what was it like Silent Hill Revelations or something like that because that was at a period of time where every sequel was subtitled either The Revenge Revelations or some R word so without game, like if Kit, if Kit Harrington wasn't Jon Snow no one knows who Kit Harrington is at this time the same goes for Amelia Clark I'm yeah. sure but it also also brings up the question of like does does Tamsin Merchant wind up getting cast in Solo a Star Wars story in which case, who's playing a young Al Pacino? <laughs> <laughs> we could go like several layers on this one. <laughs> Who plays the young Al Pacino in Solo with Tamsin Merchant? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so like moving on to another one, we got Nick Cage in Lord of the Rings. I think that I feel like in this one, we don't necessarily see a major impact on Nick Cage's career. Because he does everything. Because he does everything. Besides Lord of the Rings. I don't think that we'd see That's, a well, major. I think, I think that was before he went broke and kind of had to take every every role he got thrown his way. You got a point. After he bought his like third castle or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but do you think that maybe he winds up doing more serious roles after that? Less of, you know, he's not really doing Manny or, uh, you know, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Maybe he winds national up National Treasure? Does he do National Treasure still? Oh, that's the big one. Because if he doesn't do National Treasure, is life worth living? I don't know. I guess I don't think it is. No, I don't think so either. Because if Nick Cage is not stealing the Declaration of Independence, I'm not down. No, I think it has way more impact on Viggo Mortensen. Oh, yeah. Because, like, he had a career before, but he was very much a background player. Yeah. I you mean, know, especially doing his- Doing smaller bit parts. His two Texas follow-ups- Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. His two like, follow-ups to Return of the King was Eastern Promises and History of Violence. Uh, don't forget Hidalgo the Wonder Horse. Hey, that was- but that came in between. Oh, was it in between? Yeah. Sorry, I just, I, I have to love that that film unapologetically because my dad, I don't know if he necessarily likes the movie so much as he likes saying the title, but but every single time that anybody brings it up without fail, he's just like, what movie do you mean? Oh, you know, Hidalgo. Oh, what movie? Hidalgo, the Wonder Horse. 
Not to be confused with War Horse. Which, by the way, the title is not Hidalgo the Wonder Horse. My dad added that part for flavor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and since we're since we're talking about the Lord of the Rings, we might as well, you know, Sean Connery. Uh, as opposed much. to Ian McKellen. Yeah, I don't really think that it that it affects Ian McKellen too much because he already had, like he was already Magneto, yeah. you know, which is, you know, say what you will about the way that the X-Men film franchise went from there, but the first X-Men film was big. It was huge. And plus Ian McKellen would have just been happy to play like, you know, King Lear and other roles in, in England forever. I'm yeah, sure he would have been stoked like, on that. That's just Ian McKellen's style. Um, we also, you know, it really wouldn't have affected uh, – well, it would have affected Sean Connery in that he probably would not have done the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen because he wound up doing that because he saw how big Lord of the Rings was and he's like, oh, I need a franchise. So he went yeah, and did League of really Extraordinary Gentlemen. Now, did it. That movie bombed so hard he retired. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing it when it came out. I don't hate the concept. The idea of let's take – and I know that there was a comic book first – don't yell at me in the comments. Uh, but I like the idea of let's take a whole bunch of public domain characters and let's Avengers them into one movie. I don't hate it. Dorian but, Gray. Yeah, some of those, some of the characters. Like, who? Dorian Gray. His, his, we got a painting of his face. Which, Stuart Townsend, uh, another, another possible Lord of the Rings choice. Got off the Gray. That was my name. Though I think of all the people that we've mentioned... The thing that would have really affected this person's career, like the most, would be John Hamm as Don Draper. Because John Hamm just wouldn't have a career. I don't think he would, which yeah. is unfortunate because John Hamm is great. But he got into acting pretty late in his life, if I'm not mistaken, and this was his first like big time role. And at that point, if you're you know in your in your 30s and you haven't really made any headway and you get passed up for this role that you really wanted for somebody else, do you, do, do you keep going? That's a tough one. It's kind of like if uh, Alan Rickman didn't get Die Hard. You know, he was another actor who came into it super late in the game. You know, if he didn't get that, would he have kept going? But yeah, I think that's probably the biggest, I mean, just for, t for impacting one person's career, but not as much on pop culture as a whole, but just for one actor, I think. Just because just John Hamm just wouldn't have one. Yeah. Now we're going to shift our view to a bit more of a uh, global impact. We're going to be looking at the, the total overall pop culture impact of these changes. Now, again, we're going to go back to the well of the Al Pacino Han Solo one, because that is by far the one that would have the, the largest effect. Like ripples in a pond. Yeah. Because, like, if we don't get Al Pacino in Scarface... What posters are freshmen in college going to hang on their dorm room walls? It's a good question. Fight Club? That's all they got at Fight that Club point. Fight Club would be good. I'm, I think Fight Club's better than Scarface, personally. Well, yeah, but that's that's all they would have. They'd have Fight Club and then an empty space where their <laughs> Scarface poster would have been. And then one tear running down their cheek for a life that they never knew. And think about the line from Scarface. Say hello to my little friend! What if we don't have that? That has so many like pop culture like references later oh, on. Oh yeah. There's there's so many like it is it is probably one of the most referenced lines in cinema history. I think the only line that might have it beat is uh I'm the king of the world from Titanic. That's uh, yeah, that's up there. That might be the only other line that's maybe referenced more. You know, so just think about all those, all the poor comedy writers out there in Hollywood who don't have that well that they can go back to, to I know. reference. When you're, when you're, uh, when you're Paul Feig and you're writing Ghostbusters 2016 and you can't have that, have that line. Yeah, no, it just doesn't work. So we don't get Ghostbusters 2016. Ah, oh, man. That's what this all comes down to. We just don't get Ghostbusters 2016. No matter what happens, maybe it's a good thing or maybe it's a bad thing. I don't really know. I'm not going to comment on that, but... Yeah, like you, you will wind up seeing effects like that, where it's just like whole lines are cut from films because those lines don't exist. Or they're just not as big of a deal because the actor delivered it in a different way. Like if we don't get, I know Kung Fu from The Matrix, from Keanu Reeves, like I think Will Smith is great for the most part, but no way he's saying that line any 
more iconically than Keanu, than Keanu did. did in the Matrix. Yeah, no, he he'd probably he'd probably say that's hot or something immediately afterwards. <laughs> um, and that that affects what just if, pop what culture if, in general from there. I got you. I got another one for you. Ooh, you hit me with it. So the line in Empire Strikes Back when Leia says to Han, "I love you," it was an improvised line to say. Yeah, that was that I was know. that was pure Harrison Ford because the story behind that was that originally it was scripted that Han, that Han Solo was going to reply, "I love you too," but Harrison Ford looked at it and went, "That's not what Han Solo." That's not would Han say. Solo. That's not what Han Solo would say. Or or uh, Indiana Jones, um, the. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the scene with uh, the swordsman, it was originally scripted that there was going to be a big fight scene, but Harrison Ford had, uh, he had diarrhea and so he he was done with stuff at that point that day so he was just like, what if I just pulled out my gun and shot him? And everyone was just like yeah, okay. So we so wind up with that. See how it goes. Would Tom Selleck have done that? Or we would we have gotten a patented mustache action sequence? I mean, I'm down a for a, sequence, I'm down for a, for a mustache action sequence, but those are the kind of those are the kind of things we have to ask ourselves because an actor brings so much more to the role than just themselves. Themselves. There's so many imp- improv lines, the way they deliver certain lines just is not going to be the same. Even if the director has a super specific vision for how they want this line to be read, it's not going to be the same actor to actor to actor. Yeah. And that is going to in turn affect how we as audience members, not only view that film, but view just movies in general and how we're going to view popular culture and how we're going to enjoy things. Plus on top of that, some of our favorite films would be wildly affected by these things. You know, you were, you were talking about, yeah, one so there. so I was trying to th- I was trying to trace back one of these roles going to somebody else affecting something that I care about so deeply film wise. So if Harrison Ford is not Han Solo in 1977, there's a good chance he does not play Deckard in the original Blade Runner. And without the original Blade Runner, we're not getting Blade Runner 2049, which and is a travesty. Blade Runner 2049 is in my top five films. Oh yeah. It's, it's it's probably my favorite sci-fi film. Period. It's so good. We'll see if we'll see if Denny Villeneuve's Dune can top it. We'll see. But both Denny Villeneuve. The idea of not having Blade Runner twenty forty nine. I mean, obviously, I'd be bummed about the original. Yeah, because that's fantastic cinema too. But I think Blade Runner twenty forty nine is better. Which which you kind of have to you kind of have to wonder about. Uh, you know, just sci-fi nerds. What movie do they have to hold up as like the peak cinema if they don't have Blade Runner? Are they holding up David Lynch's Dune? The Dune movie with Sting in it? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Ridley Scott gets somebody else to play, oh, I'm sure. to play him. But because his star power at the time, I mean, uh, the movie didn't do that well. But it did as well as it did because it had Harrison Ford, arguably. But what it really comes down to is any of these roles, not just Al Pacino as Han Solo, but also, you know, Tom Selleck as Indiana Jones, Will Smith as Neo... You wind up with these just massive changes in the way that we view these things and the things that we love, like drastically change. Yes. Keanu Reeves is like the hero of Reddit right now. Like, according to that website, he can do no wrong. I agree with them because he's he's just an awesome dude. But like, without the Matrix, who does Reddit hold up as like this this bastion of wholesomeness? Uh, I think second place in terms of people Reddit loves is Mr. Rogers. Rightly so. Or Bob Ross. Or Bob Ross. They are, they are two of the horsemen of the wholesomeness. How much would having Amelia Clark not as Daenerys affected the backlash to season eight of Game of Thrones? Because, because it, there's a it lot was of, there's a lot, lot of her of, performance. There's a lot of love for that character. Yeah. And, you know, this isn't to throw shade at, uh, Merchant. At, at Merchant. I'm sure she would have done a great job, but is there as much fan love for that character if Amelia Clark doesn't play it? And if there's less fan love for that character, do people care as much when they do the ending? And I mean, like that really comes down to, does the series even get to season eight? Because like there was a lot carrying it, obviously, you know, a lot of people were there for the Lannisters, you know, some people were fans of the Starks, I guess, because they were kind of the main characters, but, but like, does the series make it that far? In which case... As I said, up until like the final season, it had just a death grip on society. But yeah, does does her 
alternate casting have an effect on the way that series goes and the way that the public perception of that series goes? Well, especially because the ending, not, not, not to have any spoilers if you haven't seen it, the ending of I the think series at this point we could spoil it. Um, hinges so much on her character turn. Her very sudden character very, turn. Very, very sudden character but turn. But still the character turn. And if people aren't as in love with that character, in large part thanks to Amelia Clark's performance, I feel like the backlash would have been a little softer maybe. Or on the flip side of that, maybe Merchant manages to do it better. Maybe. Maybe because of Merchant's performances, ben and, uh, ben, ben and off? Benioff. Benioff and Weiss are able to and willing to write things with a little bit more care and are able to deliver us a character turn that's maybe a little bit more subtle. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> this is, I'm just throwing out wild what ifs at this point. <laughs> but, you know, maybe that allows for a better season eight because maybe her performance is able to carry it more. Maybe. It's not easy to see something that's never been before. Okay, so let's imagine for a second that we live in the world where all of these alternate castings happened. What does that world look like? Let me set the stage for you. It's 2020. Will Smith has managed to use his charisma to make his way into the White House. Oh yeah, President Smith, we're going there. So Will Smith is president. Nick Cage has won five Oscars since he appeared in Lord of the Rings. That dude is just crushing it. He's proven that he is the greatest actor of all time. Just absolutely dominating pop culture but not as much as Al Pacino, who's managed to not only leverage his fame off of doing the Godfather films, but also Star Wars to catapult himself to be the A-list of A-list celebrities. Meanwhile, Harrison Ford is a bit player on some NBC network television show that no one's ever heard of, but he's making a living. He's not, he's not married to uh, Ally McBeal, which is a bummer, but he's also not crashing any planes. So, you know, there's a bonus. Keanu Reeves, he's been in the third uh, Dracula film at this point, you know, but he still has Bill and Ted 3 on the horizon because I do believe that that film would have happened regardless because, come on, those films are classics. <laughs> Amelia Clark is pretty much unknown, I would feel, in this universe. She and uh, John Hamm were in a, were a small indie flick together. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they got some traction off of that, but not a lot. Tom Jane has managed to uh, absolutely dominate television. He just proved that he did a fantastic job on Mad Men. He managed to transition into all of his, you know, preceding roles. He crushed it in Baby Driver. Just did a fantastic job. Because that movie would still happen because Edgar Wright is a, is a treasure. Uh, and uh, Hayden Christensen's got his third Oscar. Hayden Christensen is also crushing it for some reason. <laughs> I don't know how any of this has affected him, but... You know, it changed how the prequels happened. Because the, the prequels managed to be the greatest trilogy in history. It even surpassed the original it trilogy. The original. It just made everything so much better. So much so that George Lucas didn't sell Star Wars to Disney. He's still owning it. Made a sequel trilogy completely different from what we got. We got the sequel trilogy that he wanted. Take it or leave it. I'm not going to comment on whether that's good or bad. It just is. And we got to watch a movie where... Uh, uh, you know, Tamsin Merchant and some bloke played a young Al Pacino in a solo standalone film. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a much different world. Much different. Dorm room walls are no longer adorned with Scarface posters, but are instead... Quigley uh, Down Under. Quigley Down Under. Because somehow, even in this alternate universe, we managed to get Quigley Down We're Under. We're not losing it. We're not losing Quigley. I don't care. If I'm designing an alternate universe, that movie's sticking around. And that is the alternate 2020 I want to know what you guys think would have happened. You know, let us know in the comments, what have you. Owen, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, people can find me on uh, on the YouTube, on either the Slumberyard, if you want to learn more about some mattresses, or you can go to my personal YouTube channel, which would just be uh, Owen Scott Poole. Look it up. Uh, I do some, you know, your camera tutorial things and videography, photography, all that yeah. sort of stuff. They can also find you on uh, Twitter and Instagram, correct? Yes, uh, Owen Scott underscore P for both Twitter and Instagram if you want to get my takes on um, Blazers basketball. Or wrestling. Every or wrestling while. sometimes. Yeah. Or if you want to see uh, my sort of more professional photography stuff. 
yeah, go check them out over there. You can also, if you want to see more of what I'm doing, you can check me out on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Bender Waffles, all one word, B-E-N-D-E-R-W-A-F-F-L-E-S. Uh, you can also find me on YouTube under the same name, or of course, over on Screen Rant, where I'm making some fantastic content for all you lovely people. Let's do something a little more fun. How about combat training? Man, things would have been a lot different if things had gone any other way. But what do you think? How do you think life would have gone if any of these roles had gone to other people? Be sure to let me know down in the comments below. If you like this content, be sure to subscribe to Screen Rant on YouTube. Thanks for watching and stay safe out there.